Welcome everyone. I'm so glad you could join us. We are here today with our current exhibiting artist, Heidi Bruckner. Um, I will now shut off my camera and microphone and turn it over to her to introduce herself and talk about her work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Heidi. Well, hey everybody. Um, my name's Heidi Bruckner and um, I first want to say thanks so much um, to the college for inviting me. Um, I feel um, very much at home in this um, context as I am um, a community college art teacher. Um, so this is sort of, you are sort of my people. <laughs> and um, I have uh, my um, slide lecture set up here to take a look at the Monster Bet series, which is of course currently being shown virtually in your gallery. Um, so in terms of just my background, um, I am a painter, um, primarily a painter, and um, I have taught at a community college in Saratoga, California, which is in the Bay Area. Um, and it's sort of a suburb of San Jose. Um, and uh, it's a, a college called West Valley College where I teach painting and drawing and design. And I've taught there for over 20 years. Um, and um, this is a series that I have been working on. Um, it's dated 2018 when I finished it, uh, but I was working on it for over a period of several years. Um, and it contains, um, uh, it, it's a spoof on the traditional children's alphabet book. Um, so there are, um, th the works correspond to the 26 letters of the alphabet. Um, and the, there are, um, there, I really thought of them as being diptychs because, <clears throat> I've included language and text in these being a spoof on an alphabet book. And I've thought of them in terms of couplets. And so um, for the couplet is actually a literary term, which means two lines of verse that usually have the same meter and they, they're joined by um, a rhyming word, uh, much like the way alphabet books can be um, take form. Um, and so, um, in, in, in here, um, I'll be showing you each one, each uh, individual piece, um, and I'm gonna go through some faster and, and I'll slow down on others. Um, but each, the, the basic concept is each, um, each letter stands for an invented monster that has some kind of particular quirk. Um, and uh, again, the idea was sort of appealing to me because I think that the idea of a, um, of a, 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 an alphabet book can be sort of benign and childlike, but I'm coming from the, an assumption that the reader is not necessarily coming from a place of innocence in the world. Um, my, my work has always been kind of gritty and dark. And um, so, you know, it, the, the idea of um, the characters within this, this um, series um, touch on different themes of human vice and morality and things like that. And um, just uh, the idea of after I, um, I, I, I finished the series was um, that I would publish a book um, of that series. So actually make it into a book, even though it was a physical, um, it, these were physically paintings um, that you hang on the wall. Um, so I'm, like I said, I'll take you from through some images a little bit more quickly. Some I'll go in um, a little bit more in depth, but um, if, you know, as I go through, what I might suggest is that anybody um, who, if you see something that, um, and you think about asking me a question or you're curious about certain pieces, um, maybe remember just the letter of the piece um, uh, and um, 
then it, because the names are all invented of each monster so it might be difficult to remember that so just rem maybe remember the letter and if something catches your eye about maybe the materials or why I use certain imagery or elements um you know or how i came up with something then that might be something that that it would be an easy way to refer back to it so um the first one here is um titled all me and um they're purposefully a little bit jumbled in terms of um how one reads it that's done for whimsicality but also um just to kind of see um the painting as a whole design as well initially um and this one deals with um society's misguided importance on feminine beauty um and she's a beauty queen but she's sort of a beauty queen in an alternate universe and um the norms of beauty that are indicated here seem a little may, maybe seem a little bit strange or different um to outsiders like us um but the irony here is that the norms of female trappings might be a little bit ridiculous or um how 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 one might look at them um so that's been a theme actually in my work for a while um and that, i thought that was fitting that maybe this was the first one usually um all the names as i said are invented so they tend to be something that's kind of phonetically connected to um the theme even if the um even if the if the spelling is different so all me kind of has to do with this idea about it's all about me and um the the idea of narcissism is also um i think i think touched on here um part of what was an inspiration for this whole series was um the seven deadly sins and also i would i guess a shout out to edward gory in his um work on sort of nasty children in the alphabet um so this one works with this idea i think of pride and lust as well and and then questioning those things um this is a companion piece it's a toilet monster um it has um sometimes i will work with alternative materials that have something to do with the theme so these little um i think i can zoom in here these little uh spikes here are all um uh colored pieces from uh or pieces that i've cut uh from a um, toilet scrub brush and that i put through um some coloration um to make them more decorative um, this is a baby monster, um, and you'll see again that's um, you know that there's sort of some, something usually that happens in um, the imagery that has that has connection. So these are actually three dimensional um, safety pins, um, much like what you see on the diapers here. Um, here's a little. Um, you can see that this this character has three eyes the little doll here also has three eyes in in um in a let's see if i can zoom in the little doll here also has three eyes oh three eyes kind of in the image of um that that being uh herself um okay and let's see here um this this series also works with a lot of um decorative paper so um sometimes things are painted in um i use a lot of uh busy pattern and i like to juxtapose a lot of patterns together so some things are painted and some things are existing that i use um in this particular circumstances um uh, well one of the things is there's the these are um uh antique doll eyes that so i'll oftentimes have three-dimensional things that um that are um in the mostly two-dimensional surface um and then we have some existing paper for the border and for um the background here and one of the things i used here was tar gel to kind of create a new pattern 
um, which is an acrylic medium that I think is put out by Golden. Um, and I think uh, one thing also is that um, when I was starting this series, um, my, I, was, I uh, was a parent of young children um, and um, struggled with having a full-time job and being an artist and um, being a parent. And so um, the idea sort of occurred to me because I would read a lot of these books and I thought, well, this could be kind of an interesting fixed format that I could play around with um, as a person that doesn't have maybe a lot of time to do, to think up all new designs with every piece and, um, but I could, I can come back and kind of play in and out of that fixed format. Um, and so that consistency was pretty good for me in those years where my, my life seemed very inconsistent. Um, and so that's sort of how this was born. Um, this is Eat Mach. This is the uh, monster I would say, that I guess this is loosely based on gluttony. Um, of one of the seven deadly sins. And, um, but it's more about ideas of self-control and navigating as your own person, what you might consider excessive. Um, and then I think it questions whether there's anything really wrong with being upset, uh, excessive. And we all have that threshold, I think. Um, I think um, the idea of being excessive or losing control is also something that can be kind of attractive. Um, and, but there's all sorts of irony here. For instance, this um, pig-like creature is wearing vertical stripes um, in a way to um, sort of ironically create a slimming look for um, themselves. Um, and some of us might know that trick <laughs> about fashion. Um, but also, I think one thing that's that's you, if you sort of think about some of the imagery here, and I'll zoom in a little bit on um, the tray here. One of the things here is um, a ham that's on the tray, and of course, if I zoom out here, the border is made up of slices of bacon. So there's also this sort of idea that maybe he's eating his own kind. And um, that I think is quite disturbing, but then that also um, I think maybe brings up some ideas about maybe excess, one's excesses might cause others, um, cost others. Um, so we can think about that maybe in a broader scheme um, in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, you know, have and have nots in our world, that kind of thing. Um, and um, I talked about the couplets. Um, I think that the, the, I, I've always been a, a figurative artist. So I've, I've mostly worked with the human figure before. So this has been, I've blended that always with sort of um, um, invented imagery oftentimes. Um, but it's also uh, been sort of going into this world where it's almost all invented. Um, it's been kind of an interesting way to integrate that language part of it. Um, and so what's been fun is really um, figuring out um, the most effective term, turn of a phrase in relationship to the um, creature itself. And so that's fun. I, I think uh, one of the things that was challenging was, you know, thinking about the rhymes, but then also thinking about well, the word that should rhyme might also have, you know, probably should have something to do with something about the, the creature. And so um, the, um, that playing with the language and the using of text and, and using the text in sort of a design based way um, was, was and is very interesting to me. I, I really loved exploring um, the language part of this as well and, and combining it with the sort of fanciful approach 
um, was really exciting for me. And again, that fixed format, I sort of had this fixed format that I'd have um, the border, I'd have a character, I'd have um, the, the letter in the corner, and then I'd have this space where I'd integrate the language, um, which was all a really kind of um, fun way um, and, and always gave uh, to approach something, a, a project or a series, but it also always gave me this kind of um, thing that I could always go back to if I had to go back to the um, creative drawing board, so to, so to speak. Um, this is the smoking monster. Um, so again, a lot of things to do with vice. Um, this character, Ik Yum, um, is, is meant on the surface to be um, something that's attractive or alluring. So this is, you know, this character, this person being is completely made out of candy. And, um, but the idea here is really the creature who uh, isn't quite what they seem either. So um, the phrase is, is for Ik Yum, who, uh, who turns on a dime. The idea of turning on a dime or having um, a, a, a veneer, uh, but when that is lifted, something different happens or, you know, it indicates maybe a volatility of personality. Um, and so for me, that was a metaphor of human behavior. Um, people can be not what they seem on the surface. Um, and you can see, for instance, um, one of the things that I tried to play up was, of course, this is, you can see the, uh, that this is all made out of candy. Oops, oops. Um, but also, um, let's see, I'm trying to move this around. So let's see here. Um, all of these in the corn, in the, on the framework are, are sort of, is the, are dimes that have been um, um, painted in different colors in sort of a candy colored kind of way, um, which relates again back to um, the, the language. So again, that was always something that I tried to kind of integrate with the materials. Um, this is its companion piece. Um, and this is basically jerk. He's a, sort of a play on the word jerk. Um, and he's a basically a filth monster. Um, really, for me, meant to expire a call to action. I um, I create a lot of work that has environmental themes, and so there's quite a few pieces in here that um, have that. He's uh, sort of part rat, part nuclear power plant, part uh, trash can. Um, part sewage, sewage uh, spewer, um, kind of stands in a pool of his own refuse. He's um, spewing contaminated air. Um, the color palette is meant to be kind of grim and, and, and gray, um, which you know, one imagines could happen if, if we become over polluted and, um, you know, the, the climate situation continues. Um, so that is a theme that's actually very important to me and that's come up in, in other pieces that I've done in this series and in other series. Um, this is Crooked. It's about a kid who does um, all the wrong things. Um, and um, gets into trouble, sort of takes, uh, the, takes the form of an octopus. So every arm in here is, is doing something that's sort of frowned upon. Um, and I wanna maybe talk a little bit about um, the use of allegory and archetypes in my work. And that's something that I've done a lot of. So even when I'm working figuratively, um, I work with a lot of allegory and, and um, archetypes. And so just to, to be um, a little bit more clear about what that means to me is, um, so an allegory is generally like a, a story or a poem um, that can be interpreted. Usually there's um, 
some kind of a meaning. There, there might be a literal meaning and there might be sort of an abstract meaning. And oftentimes um, that meaning is political or it's moral. Um, so that for me tied into this idea of what this series could be. And archetypes are simply sort of uh, characters that play roles in these stories. And so um, each one of these creatures is perhaps kind of like the prototype or the model um, from which uh, others are made from. So in a way it's uh, very relatable to human characteristics as well. And so that's, that's this idea of the allegory and the archetype is something that I, I, I really love. Um, uh, here's a, here's a, um, a ballerina. I love the idea of a ballerina monster. I think I saw that movie Black Swan at the time and it sort of had an effect on me that there was sort of this interesting um, duality or dynamic. Um, also with this uh, before, for instance, I've done with this um, series, um, of archetypes um, or this, this interest in archetypes. I also did a, a, a series of really large paintings. These are pretty small. These are 16 by 16 inches. The other ones that I've done have been very big kind of life-size figures. So, you know, maybe up to um, like, a, you know, maybe six and a half feet tall and 40 inches wide. Um, and so I did the, the whole series of the, before this on arc, um, on, excuse me, on tarot cards, which was also a very interesting kind of way to go about looking at, um, our, at uh, allegory. Um, you may have seen this in the show promotion. This piece is, is one of my favorites. Um, this is the money monster. Um, and again, sort of this idea of, um, of uh, wealth and perhaps touching on the idea of, you know, that there's this huge wealth gap in the world. There's a huge wealth gap in the United States, but also in the world. Um, and the companion piece to this is um, the one that's, that's the opposite of that. So sometimes they're kind of connected thematically, um, sort of the opposites or even same, but, um, but sometimes they're not. In this case, they, they are. This one, um, it, the, he's quite literally made of money. So the actual, um, the actual uh, person you might call or creature is, is actually made of, of cut up um, dollar bills. And um, you can maybe see that a little bit easier here. Um, and then also the overall structure of it is a money sign, which is maybe a little bit hard to see at first, but you can see the two um, the two poles that would run through a money sign. So here he is, is, is sort of thought of as, or presented as some, some sort of a king or royalty. Um, he's, he's got his throne, this is a throne that's in the background. And then he's quite literally skiing down um, piles of money. Um, so the background here is um, actually uh, copies of uh, big piles of money. Um, and then on the borders, which is um, um, actually, it's about, oh, maybe it's about an inch thick of um, piles of um, straight pins. Um, there's also uh, dollar bill fragments that run across here that say that are completely made of the dollar bills, but it says united we drool all through the piece. And um, this is not lot the companion piece that I had mentioned, um, where um, this is basically um, a person that's sort of the most vulnerable kind of creature, um, almost a one man band. Um, this, this, he's got sort of this contraption that he's um, set up that has all these multiple instruments. Um, he's also walking across a tightrope and has an umbrella to uh, balance himself out. And you can see that he's got, even for his show, 
uh, a little money cup that says trickle down tips, thanks. Um, and again, I just love that, that contrast um, of, the two, of the two creatures. Um, this is my ophis, which is uh, kind of a cross between a doofus and an oaf. Um, and I thought of this um, as um, sort of a, a, a figuratively and literally a brainwashing monster. And, and, and he takes the, 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 um, the form of a blowfish whose tentacles are Venus flytraps. Um, and I and I very much saw this um, this creature as being sort of akin to a radio talk show host, um, and a lot of the polarizing information that um, that is out there that we have to sift through as consumers. Um, I'll focus on a couple more here, and then um, we can open it up for questions too. Um, th this um, next um, pair are also thematically connected. Um, they're both about addiction. Um, and this one, Quick Fix, it's, it's basically a creature that's made up of all sorts of um, substances that are abused um, in, in, in sort of vice. Um, so it's the, the, the body is kind of, uh, it's kind of figured out uh, after a, a, an espresso machine. So you can see the little espresso here, but it's also kind of a hookah um, for smoking. Um, so this is the smoking tube, but it's also kind of a tube like, um, like a, I'm trying to think of what those are called, uh, keg, beers, beer, you know, a big keg of beer. Uh, this is the tap from that. Um, the arms, it says like one is a spoon with lots of pills. Another one is a, a, some kind of a needle that has some kind of substance inside that might make one feel differently. And the whole idea of it is to be sort of crazed and, and overwhelming. Um, so it, this is a quick fix uh, who's helped some procure. And this is uh, R is for Rotsam who's got Oh, they, they, they don't rhyme, sorry. They, they, they are companion pieces, but they aren't the rhyming pieces. They're just next to each other, um, which is a screen monster. And so um, the, uh, this, this screen monster was uh, certainly, um, you know, in our modern day, something that we probably all struggle with. I struggled as a parent at the time to, to see my kids, how they used screens, how I was supposed to be uh, regulating that, um, but then also in my own life as an adult, how I regulate that. A lot of times we're working on a computer and then does that go slides into entertainment easily and sometimes your whole world ends up being a computer for that day. So this is um, this was made out of sort of an old fashioned 50s um, TV contraption piece of furniture, um, but then also has laptops and um, and, and tablets and uh, smartphones for future for features. Um, it's got um, an old keyboard keys as part of the three dimensional elements. It says escape screen love escape. Um, and then uh, this is this is another. Um, one that is thematically co connected, and as I said, my um, my interest in in um, in um, environmentalism tends to creep into my work quite a lot. So this one um, is some is um, called Sploit, and it is for uh, exploit. Um, and um, re re really represents the kind of the uncaring and the environmentally explosive side of exploitive side of society. Um, he's sort of a half mosquito, half oil Derek um, that's kind of hooked up to a gas um, a, 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 a gas dispenser, um, and sort of the system sort of gone awry. He's reaping the earth for his own personal gain. So he's um, sort of 
sitting in his own um, muck again, sort of like the last piece we I was talking about, kind of drilling down underneath for oil. Um, and there's a lot of kind of oiled machinery surrounding him. We've got some um, pipelines and things like that related to that idea. Um, this is Thwap, it's, it, it's companion piece. And he's sort of the environmentally regenerative monster who's fighting against um, all the destruction, the human made destruction. Um, so he's sort of Godzilla-like, he's sort of an ancient Japanese warrior. Um, but he, of course, is fighting back with fire, uh, which is something that, you know, we sort of can think of when we think of severe weather conditions um, and um, things that have um, gotten worse because of global warming, um, the natural disasters that we're having. Um, so he's really actually the only character that I don't necessarily relate to human behavior, but I almost think of this as mother nature and kind of rebelling against um, humankind and regenerating. Um, so the bottom here is, um, let me try to that again. The bottom here is a city that's being crushed. And then these are all little people that have been um, scorched um, in order to kind of take back uh, nature as it should be. Uh, this is the death monster. Um, and this will be probably the one I, the last one I kind of talk a little bit further about um, is, um, this is the luck monster, voodoo doll. So again, it's a play off the idea of a, a voodoo doll um, who makes things more certain. So um, it's really riddled with symbols from different cultures of um, luck and superstition. Um, and I think uh, I can zoom in here a little bit. You know, there's a magic eight ball. The whole thing is sort of like a voodoo doll. There's a four leaf clover as an eye, a coin a, kind of represent a, a, a coin toss. Um, the legs are made of a, a wishbone. We've got a rabbit's foot here. Um, this one being a horseshoe. Um, this, this guy's hand is holding a, um, uh, uh, one of the little kitties that are oftentimes in Asian restaurants that sort of wave at you and bring good luck. Um, and then this is a fortune cookie. Um, the, uh, the border is um, decorated with um, the little, um, uh, the little um, objects that are, these are from Turkey actually, that are um, meant to keep away the evil eye, sort of being little eyes themselves. And dice, kind of this idea of throwing the dice um, as well. And um, it is kind of a, I'd say, say just sort of questioning this idea of luck and superstition and how it plays into each individual's life. Um, you know, there might be someone that's very much in, um, you know, believes in science and, um, you know, overwhelming evidence to sort of have their logic um, be based on. Um, but, but what degree do each of us also kind of think about faith or hope or fate um, as well? And um, to a greater to less or lesser degree, which happens in all cultures. Um, so to me, that was very interesting. Uh, this is a smelling monster. I've used a lot of um, like garlic skin in this as a medium. Um, uh, this is um, a political monster. He's named Zeno for xenophobe. Um, he's a, he might be sort of, I would say, lightly connected to wrath or anger from the de seven deadly sins. Your and yours is, um, this is a jealousy or envy monster, also kind of working on against that theme. And here our last one is Zeal Nun, which is, is, a, is a sloth uh, monster, which is um, also, also um, obviously related to the seven deadly sins. Um, and so I'll end just saying um, that 
I guess just one thing that my, one might be wondering about this is, is how I went about doing this. And, um, you know, did I do it in order or did I, how did I do it? And so I purposefully did it out of order. Um, and uh, because I didn't want it to be glaringly obvious that there was a change in the way I did something from beginning to end. So um, that was something that I tried to do, but also um, in terms of this series, they, they, I would worked on a lot of them, all of them, as a matter of fact, I never put the finishing touches on any of them until the last, um, the last to, until they were all finished in the last year. Um, so that was kind of, I think, a really interesting experience too for me because um, oftentimes one can kind of maybe work just on a single piece and I love doing that too. Um, but for me, this always gave me something to do if I was sort of blocked or frustrated on something, I would go to something else that I was clear on. Um, and so being able to have one inform the other was really important in terms of the process. Um, and I think that that just working on a series can kind of help bring that about um, in terms of, you know, one thing informing the other. Um, and again, I think this kind of consistency of having this theme was really a great way for me as an artist to focus on, um, you know, having something consistent in my life in a, in a, at a time where I sort of otherwise felt scattered. Um, so I think I'll end on that, that it was just also kind of a, a mentally um, challenging, but also sort of healing way for me to integrate art into my life. And um, I think the last slide here is, if you just wanna see more of um, some of my different bodies of work, you can go to my website um, here. And then I'm also on Instagram, here, which um, has mostly the Monster Bet series, but also has a, a lot of, um, of, um, of work that I'm working on now, which I've gone back to doing a lot more figurative based work in particular um, portraits. So um, you can see that, I, that I, I sort of bounce around in terms of subject matter. Um, but um, anyway, I wanna say, um, Thanks for listening, and I, I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, so everybody should have the capability to actually turn on your mic if you would like to directly ask a question. Um, I'll go ahead and start out. There were a couple in the chat. Um, and if you can't turn on your mic for any reason, you're also welcome to type a question in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so I'll start with one from Richard. Um, he asks, um, in some of your paintings, the text is easy to read while in others it blends into the background and it's hard to read. Is there a reason for this? Um, o versus Q, for example. Um, well, you know, that is a great question. And I've, I've thought about that a lot myself. Sometimes it's just the way things come together, um, but I never really minded that it wasn't super legible. Um, I kind of enjoyed the fact that one had to kind of look at it for a long time to kind of figure it out. Because for me, it was also, uh, text is very much of, the, of, of just a shape or a design element. And so, um, you know, I thought about that, but I also ended up feeling like that was okay for me because, um, you know, it, 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 it sort of invites a little bit more um, it, it, a, a, little, a little bit more time to be taken to, to look at the work. Um, so yeah, some of them are um, a lot easier to read than others. I think also um, they tend to be a little bit easier to read, um, it, you know, when you have the physical object in front of you. Um, I think on the slides, sometimes it doesn't come across. They're, you know, they're, the, the, the images are quite small when they're um, usually uh, digital, um, unless you have a really big screen. So um, yeah, I think that's an interesting thing to have thought about. And I have thought about that. And um, I, I, think I, I think I came down on the side that I enjoy that. We've got Ron in the Q&A who asks, what is the overall size of these pieces? And is that purposeful or have a subtext to the piece? 
Um, so the, the size um, really came out of wanting it to sort of feel like a book size. Um, and so, um, but at the same time, I wanted to have enough room to, to, um, to put everything in that I wanted to put in. You can see that I have a bit of a, there's a, there's a Latin term um, called horror vac vacui, which means um, a fear of blank space. <laughs> um, and so I, I felt like I needed it to be sort of big, kind of on the border of being not too big, but not too small. So that's where the 16 by 16 came in. And then I looked into, when I did the book, I looked into if I could actually make the whole book 16 by 16, but it was, um, it was just um, super prohibitively expensive because it was such an odd size. So I ended up making the book 12 by 12, which is a little bit smaller than the real life, but it has enough presence that, that it kind of works. So um, yeah, so for me, that was just, um, it was sort of a wanted to be book-like, but also the practicality of having some room to work in made it you know, bigger than the average size book. Um, I, I mentioned that a lot of my work has been really large size, um, and um, human size with the, with the figures, especially. So uh, for me, it was kind of relaxing to do something that was on small, on what was a small scale for me um, for a while. Um, so that's the logic behind, yeah, the, the form it took. I think Richard has a question. Go ahead and ask if you can turn on your mic. Yeah, I do have a question. Hi, Heidi, thanks for sharing your work with us. I found it very interesting and I'm glad to hear there's a book because I think having a book in hand allows someone to spend more time pondering uh, the meaning behind your art. Uh, do I understand correctly that the book is already published? Yes, yes, and thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, it, it is, um, if you go to my website, it's um, there's a button that you can press that just takes you to the Etsy shop where it's available. It's also available on Amazon. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are meant to be, as you, you got it exactly right. Those are meant to be pieces that you ponder because there's a lot to look at and, you know, to make the connection, all the connections um, in a brief um, slide lectures, you know, asking kind of a lot. Um, and it's always a little bit of a struggle to kind of put this together in a half hour slide lecture because, um, you know, there's a lot more I could say about each one, but definitely they are meant to be um, looked at more thoroughly. So, you, you know, you're right on the nose with that one. Yeah. So do, do, do uh, the, do the, the uh, paintings, are they accompanied by some of your thoughts on them? Um, they, they don't have, they don't have, um, um, a description of each one um, in the book, but there is a foreword that um, uh, the art critic Barbara Morris, she's a friend of mine, she, she writes for Art Artillery Magazine, which is one of the last print magazines, that art print magazines they have around. Uh, she, she, there's a foreword that she wrote and that I think explains it pretty well, but I think also, um, I think intentionally not because I like that idea of maybe discovering for yourself what what's there. And also, you know, of course, it's one of those things you put those things out in the world and and there's a, a you know, a plethora of interpretations that can come come out that the that, that the author never even thought of. So I think um, for me, it was more about having the work, um, the the visual uh, be what was most important. So, I yeah, I decided not to to do any accompanying writing. Anybody else? In the Q&A, Ron asked, um, what is next for you? What are you currently working on? Okay, so um, yeah, I, um, you know, when I was done with that series, I worked on it for many years and I, I was done, you know, after that, I was sort of just needed something different. So um, I went back to my first love, which which is um, the figure. 
and in particular portraits. So I've been doing a lot of really large scale um, portraits. Um, and, and that's something that I've been um, doing um, in the last couple of years. Um, and so if you go to my website, you can see those. Um, they're very um, similar in the sense that there's a lot going on and they're very colorful and there's a lot of pattern. Um, and then there's, you know, some kind of a figure that's included. Um, and, and then you, I, there tend to be more kind of personal, subtle narratives as opposed, uh, as, about, as opposed to something that's a little bit broader. Um, but again, I think there is a little bit of the personal is the universal with them. And I'm still, um, they're not quite so blatantly um, allegories and, uh, and things like that. And you can see the, the tarot series on my, um, on my website too, which is um, called the Arcana Shuffle. It's, you, you'll see different, um, how it's split up, it's portraits and the Arcana Shuffle series and the Monster Bet series. Um, so now, even though I've gone back to the figure, it's a little bit less kind of overarchingly allegorical and more focused on the person or the personal. Um, and I still experiment with a lot of materials right now. Um, what I'm doing is I've been doing a lot of painting on bubble wrap that um, I've pieced together from um, being in COVID times and receiving all kinds of things by mail order. And it's all in this bubble wrap and excessively wrapped and things like that. And I thought I can't just let this stuff go to waste. And uh, so I started making, um, using a lot of the paper bags and the bubble wrap and stuff like that as, um, as uh, the base for paintings and drawings. Um, so that's been kind of fun. Um, and, you know, my love of, of, of sort of integrating different alternative media is sort of still around in that way. Yeah, so that's, that's something that I'm very excited about and been, um, have been doing um, a little bit more um, currently. All right, anybody else? Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, okay, I, I uh, uh, multitasked here and went to your website, uh, Heidi, and I'm just looking at uh, all of the portraits and they're spectacular. Oh, thank you. That's just such a sweet thing to say. <laughs> it always feels good. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. I'm humbled. I've always loved, uh, I've always loved faces and, um, and I've always maybe had a knack for doing them. And um, since the pandemic hit, I was so missing being around others and, and just that social aspect that I think that also kind of turned me towards the portraits um, that I've been doing lately as well. Um, so yeah, that's another reason. Yeah. And anybody else? I've been really bad at checking any of the chat. Um, you got a, you got a comment just now. Yeah, and that's very yeah. sweet. Thank you very much. Whoever put that in, in the comment. Um, and sorry, I'm getting this. My phone is hooked up to my computer. So um, I love the idea of somebody tattooing one of my monsters. <laughs> I don't know what the copyright situation for that would be, but I think it's a delightful idea. <laughs> um, so thanks for that comment. Um, all right. Well, anybody else? Heidi, what process did you go to to make your idea become a book? Well, you know, uh, thanks, Tracy, for that for that um, for that comment. Um, it, I always guess I I kind of always thought that maybe one day I would um, create a book, um, but I wasn't really sure. And technology has changed so much over the time that it took to make the series. Um, I would do. I would do other things in between um, as well. So sometimes I put that project on hold. Um, so I never really understood maybe how it was gonna be. 
um, until, you know, it's sort of was the project was completed. Um, but it was always an idea in my mind, um, even though first and foremost, it was meant to be these physical paintings that one would hang on, on a wall that was sort of evocative of a book, but wasn't necessarily a book. Um, so, um, and then in terms of process, these are very process heavy. They were very planned. Um, I did a lot of preliminary sketching and, um, you know, uh, moving around of different elements and thinking about how the, how the text would integrate. Um, and sometimes, um, and so that was an interesting process for me because sometimes, um, you know, my work has been more spontaneous or sort of in the moment. Um, and so that kind of planning, um, you know, I think there's always a question of, of how much one as an artist plans and how much one um, lets it happen. And so this was definitely on more on the side of the scale where there was planning going on. Um, and um, before, uh, you know, I've also been so much about process and sort of letting it, in, integrating what happens in the process into the final outcome. Um, I liked having, seeing how something that was a little bit more controlled um, felt. Um, and then, you know, I tend to go the opposite direction once I do something like that, where I, then I sort of have really embraced the spont spontaneous. So, um, so that was an interesting project in that way. The, the, the planning was very intense. But once you came up with your idea, you know, you have it all together. How did you make it become a book? That was kind of the question why I was wondering, did you, um, did you uh, go to like one of the sites where you had it printed yourself? Because I noticed on your website, you are selling your book. So do you do that? Just have them made and then you sell them? Are you working with a publisher? Just for students, like in case somebody wants to expand and try to go into books and stuff. Right, yeah. So for me, um, I, I, I was always thinking that I would bring it to a publisher and I have done that a little bit, but I actually was trying to get it done in time for a show. So I just self printed. I took it to a really great um, printer in Berkeley that was really high quality. Um, so I printed out a number of them and then, you know, I've made it so I can print out more. Um, but for now it's self-published and I just sell them the ones that, you know, I have, um, th that I've printed, I'll, I, I sell those. Um, and then I'll reorder if I start running out or something like that, but it's never, it's not out of the question. I just haven't had the time to really, uh, start to research that. And, um, you know, there are a number of things now too, with, with technology as it is that it may be something I turn into. Um, it, I don't know if anybody's heard of that website issues, but you can actually put um, an example of a magazine or a book or whatever. And then that can be printed as a, a one-off when someone orders it. So I've been thinking about maybe working in conjunction with, um, uh, you know, getting a database of schools, um, that I might work in conjunction with to, you know, advertise them through their libraries and things like that, where they may order through that service. So I've been, I, I haven't really looked into it enough to know. Um, and um, seems like something kind of gets in the way when I start to think, refocus on that. But that is something that I plan to do a little bit more of. Um, and it's always a possibility. I just, I'm not sure exactly how it's gonna go yet. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, are there any more questions? If there are, feel free to, to unmute. See, so, somebody have their hand up. Richard, you got one more. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sorry if I'm uh, uh, being uh, uh, too uh, involved here, but I just find this so interesting. Um, and I wanted to ask Heidi uh, if she's uh, familiar with uh, the, the quote unquote degenerate art uh, in the 1920s and 30s that the uh, Nazi party uh, uh, came out against and, uh, and destroyed much of. 
Yes, um, definitely. And, um, you know, interestingly enough, um, that's one of been one of the big influences in my life has been early 20th century uh, in my art life um, art. So I'm very aware of that. And um, the one of the artists that I love that's from that, you know, so there was the the Blue Rider and the the Expressionists, the, the bridge and the Blue Rider being in the Expressionists. And um, then there was the Art Nouveau, You Can Steal Movement. Um, but then a little bit later on, the new objectivity with Max Beckman and, and Otto Dix um, came in. And those two are some of my favorite artists. Um, and so uh, Max Beckman left left Germany, um, Otto Dick stayed in Germany. Um, but interestingly enough, he um, sort of went undercover. I understand that some of his later work that's, you know, sort of meant to be, was sort of meant to look kind of, um, um, you know, sort of Nazi acceptable in the sense that it had these sort of these ideas of beauty and landscape and homeland and things like that um, actually had quite a lot of sort of hidden symbolism in them that were quite anti-Nazi. So um, I, I always think of him as an interesting um, player in that time in, in that area of the world as well. Um, uh, so, you know, he was definitely one who did portraits of cabaret artists and things like that. Um, so he was always an, an intriguing figure to me. Um, but yeah, you know, I definitely, um, I definitely have been, um, very interested in that, that time period in that part of the world. And, um, it's something that I study. I actually took a year abroad, um, when I was in college um, in Germany, and that's I, I was able to study a lot of the work that went on in there. They have wonderful museums, um, of course, as if, if you've ever been. Um, and, and so that was a really great time in my life, and and was artistically really influenced me. So, and you're not asking too many questions because it shows you're interested, and they're good questions. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. I, yeah, I hope that answered it. Yes, it did, absolutely. Well, we are just past three. Is your, your last chance going once for <laughs> any more questions? If there are no more questions, um, I wanna thank everybody who attended and um, thank our artist, Heidi Bruckner, um, it's been wonderful to have you. Thank you for this presentation. Oh, and thank you. I am so honored to have been invited. And and thanks to everybody who showed up and and um, and uh, put up with me for an hour. So uh, so it's been a great experience. And um, and too bad I couldn't be in person. But we'll just have to wait for some other time, maybe. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you okay, thank thank you. it looks like we might have one last minute question. Um, Annabelle, Sorry, did you have a question? I was trying to type it, but I'm not fast enough. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so the monster bed, it's um, what you just showed us, is very interesting. How long did it take you to come up with all these different monsters? Um, like, it was about you... a decade that I worked okay. on it. So it, and as I said, I never really put the finishing touches on it all until kind of the last year. And I would take some breaks. Like I would, um, you know, I had a sabbatical leave and I did some abstract art for a while and um, did some other things to kind of break it up. But um, yeah, I mean, it was a good decade where that I put into figuring it all out. And I kind of felt like I needed that cooking time. So even when I wasn't, um, physically painting or drawing and figuring it out. There was a lot of thinking that went into it that sort of, I felt like that for me, that was that I required a long time just to kind of think about it and conceive of it all and put it all together into something that I could make as cohesive as possible. So the time element really helped me with the series working on it over a long period of time. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, that was, it was quite epic. And, you know, at times I sort of, um, 
you know, wanted to, to, you know, considered suicide and all that, because I just thought, oh my gosh, I've got 26 paintings, you know, that I've, that I've got to figure out. Um, but you know, you know, you just, you got to stick to it. And then, and like they said, that's why I would do other things just to kind of keep my sanity. And, and then, um, but yeah, yeah, you live long enough, then, you know, things end up working out. So, um, you know, being old has its, has being older has its um, perks. You have a long time to think yeah. about stuff. <laughs> yeah, it had to have taken a long time, especially with all the, the names and their personalities and how you wanted everything to come out. I mean, wow. Yeah. Well, thanks, Annabelle, for that question, because definitely I think you got it, got it, got it right that how you imagined it would be. It was, it was a labor of love. It was a bit laborious, but, um, but I stuck to it. So, yeah. Okay. Well, good. good. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for your question. Yep. Okay. Now, now last chance. <laughs> if anyone has another question, if we've got one more last minute question. Okay. So on that note, thank you once again, Heidi. Thank you everyone who could be here. Um, and have a lovely day. Thank you, and you too. And um, thanks everybody for your comments. I'm just seeing some of them now. Very much appreciated. Take care, everybody.